Welcome to the Lexington Public Library's Tales from the Kentucky Room podcast, where we discuss everything Lexington and Fayette County history. I'm Miriam, and in each episode of this podcast, we will feature a guest that will share a piece of local history. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy. Walking through the streets of downtown Lexington or even through its outskirts, you'll come across several historical markers. Personally, I enjoy reading them. On a level, it gives us the opportunity to figuratively reach back into the history of time and place that came before us. In A History Lover's Guide to Lexington and Central Kentucky, the late Foster Ackerman and local attorney Peter Brackney give us a concise history of the heart of bluegrass. Reading it will open your eyes and make you fall in love with this area that we call home. On today's episode, we have Peter Brackney, author of A History Lover's Guide to Lexington and Central Kentucky. So welcome to the podcast, Peter. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Miriam. A History Lover's Guide to Lexington, you co-wrote with the late Foster Ackerman, uh, who had recorded a couple of podcasts with us before. And before we get started, I wanted to kind of talk to a little bit about the contribution that he had to recording our local history here in Lexington and his role in starting up the uh, Lexington History Museum and how he impacted you and your love of history. Great. Foster was a, a wonderful friend mm-hmm. and certainly did contribute so much to Lexington's written history. Yeah. Uh, I think he was a founding trustee of the Lexington History Museum and then continued to serve as, as he wound down his law practice as kind mm-hmm. of the chief historian and president of that organization. Yeah. And a um, number of books to his his credit. And I know the hidden history of horse racing was one I think you did a podcast Correct. on. Yeah, we did. And uh, that was an interesting book and, mm-hmm. and certainly a lot of, a lot of details that, that dig a lot deeper than than what, what you can do in a concise kind of history lover's guide that mm-hmm. uh, Foster and I were able to co-write. Yeah. Our, our book together came out in October of 2020. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was uh, supposed to come out in time for the Breeders' Cup that yeah. was supposed to be that year here in Lexington. <laughs> but of course, 2020 did not turn out the way any of us expected. No. <laughs> so, um, so Foster and I had a, a great relationship working on, on, on this book together and on yeah. a couple of other projects and, um, was, was just so sad to see, see his passing and, mm-hmm. Yeah, we lost Foster Ackerman last December, I believe. That's right. uh, but his work lives on, of course. And this book is, you said it was concise. However, it's got a lot of information in there. Um, it's a small book, but it's it's very informative. And I mean, how did you guys decide on what to put in there? I mean, it's very manageable. Anybody that's reading it, it you know, once you fall in, you kind of like, wow, this is, I didn't, you know, know this about Lexington. How did you guys manage all that information into a concise history. So this was the first project that Foster and I co-wrote together. And, mm-hmm. and in doing that, we both had previously worked with the History Press out yeah. of Charleston, South Carolina. Mm-hmm. And so this is a History Lover's Guide, which is one of their formulas, in essence, for book coverage. And so Foster and I both love some of the interesting backstories of Lexington's history. So mm-hmm. wanted to include some of those throughout the book. But it is it's concise only in that nothing is is too deep. Yes. Um, you know, we're we're trying to cover a, a broad range so that perhaps the visitor to mm-hmm. Lexington might be able to learn a little bit more about the the place that they're visiting, yeah. but also some of those backstories that Foster and I love so much mm-hmm. to be able to include those so that way someone who is from Lexington might also be able to pick up the book yeah. and and learn something new. Yeah, and one of those is of course many of those are things like you know the Native Americans and then the settlement all the way through through into current history. Briefly kind of talk to us about, you know, where Lexington started, who were the founding uh, members of, of and the, the charter of Lexington and all that, um, just, you know, very quickly for our, for our podcast. Sure. So Lexington, uh, there was a few folks that were, were traveling into the area in 1775, shortly mm-hmm. after the Battle of Lexington, and mm-hmm. news had, had revealed itself uh, of that conflict against the British the start of the Revolutionary War. Yeah. So that's how Lexington came came about its name. Mm-hmm. Um, McConnell's Trace out uh, Old Frankfort Pike is is named after James McConnell. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course he was uh, one of the one of the earliest one of the earliest founders of, of, of Lexington, Robert mm-hmm. Patterson being another. Yeah. Uh, and Patterson Street that kind of extends from the Rupp Arena area. That was one of his outlots that oh. that he owned mm-hmm. over there. Lexington's charter itself mm-hmm. was in seventeen eighty two. 
1862. Yeah. So it was uh, issued by the Commonwealth of Virginia when Kentucky was still part of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Not, no statehood yet. No statehood yet. That would that'd be a decade off. Yeah. And so this area had a legislator mm-hmm. that went to the, the capital in Richmond there. Mm-hmm. And he proposed a bill that, that Lexington would be chartered. Mm-hmm. It was a kind of actually a well-known legislator, though not for being a legislator. And his name was Daniel Boone. Of course. Uh, so it's just a small figure, l- a little figure in our local <laughs> history. Uh, and so the boundaries of Lexington then were 640 acres under a Virginia land law mm-hmm. that uh, dictated how much would be divided amongst the settlers. Okay. And uh, then Lexington kind of acquired an additional 70. So that that total 710 acres was the original size mm-hmm. of Lexington. Yeah. And what's interesting is, you know, there's so much fight today about water rights, mm-hmm. uh, especially out west. Yeah. And the way water rights are handled in the in the west is different than here in, in the eastern part of the United States. Mm-hmm. But there was an 1827 U.S. Supreme Court decision, McConnell versus the Lexington trustees, mm-hmm. that went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court and was decided by uh, the opinion written by Chief Justice John Marshall mm-hmm. that dealt with Lexington's inlots and outlots and the fact wow. that uh, McConnell, his tannery was located inside the fort where one of the wells was dug. And so it was just this, Very <laughs> the, the, all, the, all these sort of details that, that really just interesting, but it ties in so much to uh, America's founding is, is in Lexington's founding all, also intertwined. Yeah. The statehood of, of, of Kentucky um, came soon after that. Um, talk to us a little bit about how state had happened and how it affected the city um, of Lexington. Sure. So a decade later, 1792, this is when Kentucky achieved statehood. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, I'd be remiss to not mention, since we're, this was a book co-authored with Foster, mm-hmm. and he, he touched on uh, the statehood mm-hmm. a, in, in his concise history chapter of yeah. Lexington. Mm-hmm. And that was a... Uh, a precursor to a book that he was working on when he passed about uh, Kentucky's rocky road to statehood. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that was most interesting about that was uh, um, James Wilkinson of Frankfurt was actually a spy mm-hmm. for Spain who was trying to see if he could get Kentucky to seed itself into becoming Spanish territory. Oh, wow. And so that that was a whole other interesting chapter. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard of that one. <laughs> in our, aspect, our early, as our, much as I've learned about Lexington, yeah, the, that aspect of it. I've the, never there heard are two of. words in, in History Lover's Guide. That's uh, Spanish spy. And so the, there's just a little hint of it in here. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, Foster had, a, had had plans to be able to tell that story in, in, in more detail. Yeah. But so, again, in 1792, Kentucky achieved statehood, Mm -hmm. and it was Lexington that became the the first capital, and Isaac Shelby, the first governor, was sworn in, you know, within a block of where the the original blockhouse of Lexington was. Uh, So, obviously, Frankfurt later became the capital, and uh, during that decade that followed, Mm -hmm. you had not just Lexington, but then that was also the establishment of the other nearby communities, Nicholasville, 1798, for mm-hmm. example. And so some of the other central Kentucky towns were becoming established during that period as well, with Lexington being the economic hub of, of the region, and which mm-hmm. certainly continued as Lexington continued to grow. Yeah. And of course, with as many states and with growth, you know, benefit, Lexington and the state benefited a lot from the um, industry of slavery. So talk to us a a little bit about slavery in the area and the role of some of the local churches and their fight to end slavery during the Civil War and even before the Civil War. So in 1830, a quarter of Kentucky's population was was black. Mm -hmm. And of course, the vast majority of that was enslaved. And Lexington's yeah. growth uh, was, was, as you mentioned, it was on the backs of, of slavery. Mm-hmm. Um, hemp was what really was an economic driver yeah. in this area. And the, the growth and the rope walks that, mm-hmm. that turned that into a material that was essential towards, towards the growth of the country mm-hmm. was, again, through slave labor. And so there, there are two churches that we kind of there are two two churches that uh, that really come to mind as as pillars of the African American community, mm-hmm. First African Baptist Church, mm-hmm. and then also St. Paul's African Method Episcopal mm-hmm. Church AME on on North Upper Street. Mm-hmm. St. Paul's AME is the oldest house of worship 
in Lexington. And that's why Lexington has named it as one of its uh, local landmarks. Oh. And so that was that building was built in 1826, so the mm-hmm. congregation is a little bit older. Yeah. And that that building itself was was on the one of the sites on the Underground Railroad. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we had a bluegrass trust detour of that of that building mm-hmm. uh, several years ago, we were able to go up and into the attic area that through renovations that occurred over time, they were able to discover where that that was Mm -hmm. and how the slaves were um, ushered up a narrow flight of stairs hidden behind a wall Mm -hmm. up above the sanctuary. And so that's where they found sanctuary for a time as they were taken to trying to find their way north. And um, so St. Paul AME and, of course, the AME Church has a a long and interesting history itself that could fill a podcast episode. Uh, But it was certainly a church that led the social movement in Lexington mm-hmm. along yeah. um, and, and, and spoke for, for equality. Yeah. The other church, First African Baptist, when the traveling church, which is a Baptist congregation in 1781, left Spotsylvania County, Virginia, mm-hmm. they brought one of the slaves that came with them was Peter Durrett. Mm-hmm. And Peter was a not an ordained minister, but but he was versed in the the Christian gospel. He then started First African Baptist as a as a slave, yeah. and his masters allowed him to have a a church that he led and allowed their slaves to to go and attend First African Baptist. Mm-hmm. After Peter Durrett mm-hmm. passed away, then London Farrell, who was a freed black man, yeah. uh, took over the pastorate of First African Baptist. He was very politically connected mm-hmm. across all streams of in the community, both both in the, the slave community as well as the, mm-hmm. the, the white community and the freedmen community. Mm-hmm. And so, with that, First African Baptist grew to actually become the largest congregation in the mm-hmm. state. They had about when he passed away in 1854, just a few years before the Civil War, mm-hmm. the church had over 1,800 members. Wow! And his his funeral then there were over 5,000 in attendance. So this man was was incredibly well-respected. It was the largest funeral in Lexington after Henry Clay's up yeah. to that time. So there was you know, a, a progression of in that church mm-hmm. of political ties with across the communities, but, but certainly there was still slavery yeah. going on. I mean, it, it, no matter how politically tied someone can be, there's mm-hmm. still slavery that, that's going yeah. on. And... and um, that part of Lexington's history cannot be overlooked. Of course, of course. And another industry that benefited from African Americans, both before the Civil War and after, is, of course, the horse racing industry. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about how horse racing became such a major industry in Lexington. At first, it would seem the trustees didn't Mm -hmm. want the Lexington trustees, which was before the council, it was yeah. the, the governing board. They didn't necessarily want what they referred to as the pernicious practice of of, <laughs> of horse racing. Yeah. Uh, there were the tree stumps on Main Street, and they mm-hmm. they were these horses that would race down Main Street. Really got in the way of things, mm-hmm. uh, so they banned the evil practice. And but of course that only meant that they you know moved a little bit uh, off Main Street. <laughs> Horse racing was was the sport of mm-hmm. the time. It was it was the social affair. It was what folks got got interested in, and just spoke about slavery. And, and many of the jockeys were mm-hmm. were enslaved, yeah. and the jockeys also could command for their masters a, a salary mm-hmm. if their owner was was not uh, the owner of the horse. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of uh, deals that went on uh, to accomplish that. But the the first race tracks were not oval tracks like we have today mm-hmm. they were they were straight tracks quarter oh. quarter mile straight tracks mm-hmm. and you would have two horses that oftentimes would race just one That's against the, the other to see yeah. who who got there first mm-hmm. uh, and they might have two or three rounds that they would do as they as they competed for any of the listeners who have read uh, Geraldine Brooks's horse the yeah. book that just came out a, a year or so ago you know that that discussed the horse lexington mm-hmm. and uh, that horse is racing uh, and some of that occurred some of those races were were here locally yeah. and one of the sites that she profiled in that book is is one that is profiled from a historical perspective in mm-hmm. history lovers guide and that's the kentucky association track mm-hmm. which was at what we would look at as fifth and 
Ray Streets, okay. where the William Wells Brown Elementary oh, School okay. is yeah, today. Yeah. Yeah. And so that association track began in 1828. Mm-hmm. And there was 50 acres that was purchased from Mr. Patterson. Mm-hmm. And another one of those names that, that keeps coming up. Mm-hmm. And so admission was free. And if you wanted to sit in the grandstands, it would cost you 25 cents. Mm-hmm. That track then existed for about 100 years Mm -hmm. up in that area. The Great Depression in 1929 and ensuing years led that track's closure Mm -hmm. to 1932. It didn't take long for some other Lexingtonians to to pick up the mantle. And (laughs) horse racing did not stay hidden for long. And the next next year, the Keeneland Association was founded. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first meet for Keeneland was in 1936. And it's 2.37. We're recording this on on Friday, the last day of the meet. And so I think the fourth (laughs) race just took off. So Kentucky is is doing – the election is doing just fine when it comes to horse racing still. Yeah. So that Still that going. is part of part of history that has has, has uh, continued, but uh-huh. such a rich history. It is such a rich history there. And the horse racing industry is definitely there's a lot to talk about over there, and of course it also influenced the way that the city grew, the surrounding neighborhoods continued to grow, uh, Lexington's boundaries expanded. Give us a brief explanation of how those neighborhoods came about. So, you know, some of it is, is scattershot. You had the in-lots and the mm-hmm. out-lots that developed from that initial 710 acres. Mm-hmm. The boundary of Lexington was the, the one mile from the, from the center point. Mm-hmm. And then obviously annexation continued to, course, to, yeah. to what ultimately led towards the, the full county being part of Lexington Fayette. Mm-hmm. But there are 15 historic neighborhoods that have been defined by the by mm-hmm. the city yeah. as historic neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. And they're um, all mentioned in your book. And, and they're all covered. Yeah, We've very got a kind yeah. of a neighborhood by neighborhood look at Ellesmere Park, uh, Fayette Place, mm-hmm. Mulberry Hill, some of the different different areas. Yeah. And each are recognized. I mentioned St. Paul AME as being one of the local historic landmarks. Mm-hmm. Helm Place is the other. Yeah. Um, Helm Place, which was recently sold. In addition yeah. to those two landmarks, there are 15 locally recognized neighborhoods then as historic districts that have an H1 zoning overlay. Mm -hmm. And so kind of use those 15 neighborhoods to kind of explore some of the little bits of backstories. Again, just touching on on, on a few things, not not able to go too deep in the the length of this book, Mm -hmm. but to go in and kind of some of the backstories and what created these different different neighborhoods. Yeah. It's Uh, very very interesting. The one neighborhood that's not inside New Circle. That, mm-hmm. that kind of is a, a different, tells a real different story than the western suburb, which was, mm-hmm. which was Todd Land, the, mm-hmm. Mary Todd's father, Robert Todd. It was his property mm-hmm. that was divided and became the western suburb. And lots of the Woodward Heights and some of the downtown adjacent mm-hmm. neighborhoods that are the, part of these 15 mm-hmm. all have a somewhat similar story as Lexington just grew incrementally from its uh, origins. Caden Town which is out towards the Hamburg area, mm-hmm. uh, tells a little bit of a different story. So that that was a neighborhood that was established after the Civil War. Mm-hmm. And that was um, one of 30 hamlets around yeah. Lexington that was a predominantly black uh, area where freed slaves mm-hmm. kind of established, established community. Mm-hmm. And so one of the structures there, there's a Rosenwald School in Caden Town. Mm-hmm. And the Rosenwald schools were named after Julius Rosenwald. Okay. And he was the president of Sears Roebuck. And so he actually spent a great deal of his own fortune in helping to establish rural black schools throughout several states, including yeah. Kentucky. Yeah. And so Lexington still has that. And I know that's been in the news lately as well yes. in trying to restore Caden Town and and, yes. and, and, and Preserving some of the history of some of those and hamlets. And we, we've done a, a podcast before on, yep. on the hamlets, and there will be new episodes about the different hamlets around Lexington coming out soon. I, I had listened to the one, so I thought. <laughs> <laughs> there, will be, there will be more, and we'll be discussing the effects of those to current day Lexington, of course. So, but, And that was something that I care about so deeply in Foster's mm-hmm. is being able to make sure that those stories are not lost and that yes. they continue to be yes. told. Yes, and I know that there's a, a big push now to – create markers for those different towns in order for them to be recognized, established around people's faiths. You know, the church was something that centered a lot of the community. What 
role did faith play in the growth of these neighborhoods, mm-hmm. if any, if they did? I'm not so sure I'd be prepared to say that, that necessarily the, the neighborhoods grew around churches so much as uh, the churches may have grown around with the, the people, uh, yeah. around the neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. You know, can the old quote, heaven must be a Kentucky of a place, has mm-hmm. some some origin <laughs> somewhere. But there certainly was a lot of, of rich faith history mm-hmm. in Lexington and, and in central Kentucky with Protestant movement at Cane Ridge. You know, one of the interesting details in that in the chapter that we talk about, which is outside necessarily of central Kentucky, but a lot of people don't realize that Bardstown in Nelson County was one of the first three diocese, Catholic dioceses in America. Yeah. After Boston and New York, it was the diocese of, of Bardstown, Kentucky, wow. uh, which included Illinois, Indiana, Notre Dame, yeah. uh, was all inside of the, the Bardstown diocese, which, of course, later went to Louisville. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's just a tremendous amount of, of rich history in, in the faith. Yeah, I mean— I- we can't talk about Lexington without talking some of the ch- about the churches. Right. And- Central Christian Church at, mm-hmm. at Martin Luther King and Short Street, mm-hmm. built on the foundation of the old Masonic Lodge. Yeah, and so that that has another another interesting mm-hmm. history to it. And if that church kind of stems itself out of the Cane Ridge tradition in Bourbon County. In the introduction, you and Foster discuss how we cannot change history, but we can change how we understand it. Uh, in particular, you discuss the removal of Confederate era statues and, and changing the name of the places. Talk to us a little bit about how these lens changes, uh, as you guys call them in the book, help us contend with a historical past that we may not be proud of, but is in fact still woven in the fabric of our historical landscape. You felt it was important to add that introduction yeah. into into your it book. It was. Yeah. So I, I remember as an author – it's very difficult to turn your manuscript over to your editors because mm-hmm. uh, you're you're giving up you're giving up a whole lot of control. And Foster and I both were were struggling because our manuscript due date was was right in the midst of of a number of events that were going on. Mm-hmm. Now the the statues of uh, Breckenridge and Morgan had already been relocated from the Lexington Courthouse lawn to the Lexington. I don't know if that I don't think they'd actually been. Um, they'd been removed. I don't think they had yet been relocated mm-hmm. to the cemetery, though I think the plans for that had been announced. Yeah. But but Foster and I had, were editing the manuscript. It had already been turned over to the publisher before our author's note had mm-hmm. been added to this text. Mm-hmm. And we're going through, and Mayor Gordon is announcing that, that Cheapside Park is being renamed after uh, Tandy. Mm-hmm. And Foster and I are trying to decide how exactly to address that because, as I mentioned earlier, we wanted this to be a resource not only for locals but mm-hmm. also for visitors to yeah. be able to uh, learn history. And so referencing something strictly as Cheapside Park would not be a, a point of origin. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, there are other places in Lexington that might also mm-hmm. have it, their name changed. So it was important to us to put this author's note at the beginning mm-hmm. to, to kind of articulate where that discussion was and acknowledge that the lens of history does change over time and how we view things changes mm-hmm. over time and that it's not a, um, a at all a bad thing to look at things mm-hmm. with a with a fresh eye fresh yeah. set of eyes certainly there was a period of time where the lost cause theology for lack of a better term mm-hmm. controlled how southern history was 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 looked at and how the civil war was looked at mm-hmm. patrick lewis who was mm-hmm. a as a scholar in residence at the Filson Society when this book was written, commented that the statues, their construction was a political decision, their removal is a political decision. And and so there was there's there's certainly politics that go into whether a park is renamed, whether um a statue is removed. There's there's a lot that goes into making those decisions. Mm-hmm. It's the historian's job to be able to kind of delve through that and make mm-hmm. sure that one side of the story is not being told, yeah. but that different perspectives are, are understood and that it is not just the winning side That's right. that is that is told, but that those who might not have, have – Well, there always has to be context, really. Isn't context. There? Yeah. There, that's an important part of, of – Telling and retelling history right. is context, and I think it was really, you know, insightful of you guys to to add that in your book and very important note to add context to this book, and so that it can it can live mm-hmm. for a few decades and, and be able to um, speak to 
the total history of yeah. of, uh, of Lexington. And there's more that, again, this is a gloss over the, the exactly. a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're not able to delve into some of no. the details. Mm-hmm. And so as we learn more about history, as, as new things are uncovered, mm-hmm. uh, new archaeology, new uh, archives are indexed, mm-hmm. and new perspectives are yeah. found, we learn more about ourselves and exactly. about our history. Exactly, exactly. And I appreciate your time and, and willingness to come speak to us about, about about your book and about the history of Lexington. We always appreciate having you here. Always great to be here. Thanks, Thank Mary. you so much. Thanks for listening to Tales from the Kentucky Room, a podcast brought to you by the Central Library's Kentucky Room staff at the Lexington Public Library. If you enjoyed listening, please take a minute to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. If you have any questions about local history or genealogy research, you can visit us in the Kentucky Room to use our collection and newspaper microfilm, or you can email us at elibrarian at lexpublib.org. That's elibrarian at l-e-x-p-u-b-l-i-b dot org. I'm Miriam, and we'll be back with another trip down Lexington's memory lane.